الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اشتبى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد آتينا موسى الكتاب فلا تكن في مرية من لقائه وجعلناه هدى لبني إسرائيل وجعلنا منهم أئمة يهدون بأمرنا لما صبروا وكانوا بآياتنا يوقنون إن إن ربك هو يفصل بينهم يوم القيامة فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون صدق الله العظيم In the previous session we were talking about the fiqh and what is fiqh in the sharia in this deen and the reason we were talking about it because insha'Allah we'll be talking about the four uh, imma of fiqh and some other scholars also of the past that did some work in the field of fiqh. So in order to understand their work and to appreciate the work was done and performed by those great scholars of Islam and at the same time to understand what type of work was performed and done and how can we benefit from it what can we do towards contributing anything from our side towards that field it's very important to understand the field itself otherwise we may see Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik rahimahumullah was, were great fuqaha, but we don't really know what does fuqaha means and what did they do if we call a person a faqih, what type of work that person was expected to perform and that person has performed. So therefore we were talking about the fiqh and we talked about brief introduction of this topic in the previous session, just continuing from there to understand a few more points about it. The ayahs that I have just recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these ayahs that are from Surah Alif Lam Mim Sayyidah told us about the previous ummas that in the previous ummas Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam came how deen was preserved after, after Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we gave Musa alayhi salatu was salam the book فَلَا تَكُنْ فِي مِنِيَةٍ مِنْ لِقَائِ Have no doubt about him receiving the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَجَعَلْنَاهُ هُدًا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We made him a person to guide Bani Israel. Then after Musa alayhi salatu was salam what happened? Who took the responsibility of teaching people the deen of Allah? وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ We made some people who were considered to be imams amongst them. We made a imma out of them. Yahduna bi amrina lamma sabaru. Who used to guide people according to our instructions and our orders when they had sabr and patience. Wa kanu bi ayatina yuqinun and they used to have firm belief and trust in our ayahs. So the word used for people who carried on with the responsibility of Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam after Musa alayhi salam and after Prophets of Allah in the past in their nations were called a imma in the term of Quran al Karim. Of course, nowadays this term is used very loosely and we used this term to, for any person who will leave the salah. But of course, that word in Quran does not refer to people just leading the salah and becoming imam. It refers to people, yahduna bi amrina, those who would guide people according to our instructions. According to instructions, given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through those Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam not each and every person in the ummah was able to follow the instructions and understand them and apply them in every new situation that will come up and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we assigned imams out of those people who would instruct people on how to follow the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those matters for the very same reason 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued with the same thing during his time and in fact he wanted to set that example for the ummah to come. So during his lifetime he sent some of the Sahaba <coughs> to different parts of the world. So these Sahaba will be teaching others the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A beautiful example that is mentioned in the hadith is when he was sending Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu to Yemen. He asked him, Mu'az, if you get a question, how are you going to deal with it? Mu'az radiallahu anhu replied, Ya Rasulullah, I will look into the Quran, into the book of Allah, and find the answer from Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدْ Mu'az, if you won't find the answer in Quran, what are you going to do? He said, Ya Rasulullah, then I will look into your hadith. Mu'al, فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدْ If you don't even find the answer in the hadith, what are you going to do then? Sayyidina Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, أَشْتَهِدُ بِرَأْيِهِ Then I will do ishtihad. In the light of Quran and the Sunnah, I will do ishtihad. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so pleased with that answer of Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu that he put his hand on the chest of Mu'az radiallahu anhu and said, I thank Allah who gave tawfiq to you, to the person that I have chosen for this work, to something that pleases Allah's messenger. Your re reply really have pleased me and I'm very happy that you know how to get the masail and the rulings of the sharia from. So Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu went to Yemen and he started teaching people the deen of Allah. Now all the people of Yemen used to ask Mu'az radiallahu anhu. No one other than Mu'az was given that right of doing his own ishtihad. Mu'az radiallahu anhu would be doing the ishtihad in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah that he learned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the rest of the people will be the followers of Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu. Other people will not do their own ishtihad because they are not of the level of ishtihad. In fact, there are hadith, as Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah has narrated in many other muhaddisin and mufassirin in their books, that during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jabir radiallahu anhu says, once we were traveling, and during the journey, one of the people with us got injured. Someone threw a stone and he got hit on his head. So there was a deep wound on his head. This person during that time while he was injured, he had a janaba, a wet dream. In the morning, he asked some people around him, what should I do? Can I do tayammu? They said, no, we have water with us. How can you do tayammu? Tayammum is only in the situation where we don't have the water. Now we have water with us. So, that person did take a shower because of the janaba. And because of the wound and the deep wound he had on his head, water got in it. And finally it caused that person's death. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew about it, he was very upset. <coughs> extremely upset with those people who told him that mas'ala, that ruling, that you cannot do the tayammum. And he said, look at the words, قَتَلُوهُ قَتَلَهُمُ Allah. They killed him, may Allah kill them. Look at the wordings. They killed him, may Allah kill them. How come they didn't ask if they didn't know it? أَلَّا سَأَلُوا إِذَا لَمْ يعلموا. How come they didn't ask if they didn't know the right answer? The treatment for not knowing is to ask. Go and ask people who know it. How come they try to find the answer themselves if they didn't know it? The hadith is clearly telling us that those people were not of the level of ishtihad. And they did not do an ishtihad. They just looked at the ayah of Quran. The ayah says, فَلَمْ تَجِدُ مَانْ فَتَيَمَّمُوا if they, you don't find water, do the tayammum, so they get issued the fatwa right there. That look, 
This is the situation. And Quran says, if you don't find water, you do the tayammum. They did not understand the word lam tajidu. You don't find means you are not able to use it in any situation. But there were none of that level of ishtihad. They gave the fatwa according to the wording. This is what most of the time we do. The same mistake we do. Many times. That we look at the wording and then we issue fatwas to people. We don't realize how many sunnas we may have killed just because of giving these opinions. How many orders and fara'id of Islam we may have killed because of giving this, these type of orders. How many fara'id we have neglected and how many people we have misguided just because of the very same mistake and the words will be repeated. Qataluhu Allah. They killed him, may Allah kill them. How many times people come up with things? Oh, I read it in the translation of Quran. SubhanAllah, are you of that level of ishtihad? If not, this deen has been established for last 1400 years. Let's find out how people, how scholars of the ummah and the ummah at large understood this ayah and this hadith. How did they practice it? We are not the first Muslims in the world. There must be some precedence to it. They must have understood it. And better than what we can understand that. Sahaba Ridwanullahi they may have gone through the situation and they issued some ruling about it. Let's find out what did they say about it. So the bottom line is that not anyone is allowed to do ishtihad. And if a person, normal person who's not of the level of ishtihad will do the ishtihad, that person deserves the punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a major mistake and anyone misguided anyone will do anything wrong this person will get the sin for all of those people that will be misled because of his issue because of his fatwa and his ruling so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this case he was very upset with these people and the case of Mu'az bin Jabal radiallahu anhu, he himself is sending Mu'az, Mu'az, you stay in Yemen and you keep on dealing with all of these type of rulings and the <coughs> rest of the people of Yemen will keep on following you. And this method continued after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu lived in Makkah Mukarramah, so he was considered to be the Mufti in Makkah Mukarramah. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu used to give all the fatwa, fatwa to the people of Makkah Mukarramah. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was considered to be the Mufti in Medina Munawwara. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu was considered to be the Mufti in Basra, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ali radiallahu anhuma were the Mufti in Kufa in Iraq. After the time of Sahaba Ridwanullahi the same thing continued. Their students took over. The student of Abdullah ibn Abbas took over in Makkah Mukarramah. So uh, Ata ibn Abi Rubah became the Mufti in Makkah Mukarramah. And uh, Ta'uz became the Mufti in Yemen, the student of Sayyidina Mu'az ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. Makhul became the Mufti in Syria in Sham. Dahak bin Muzahim, another great uh, of the Tabi'een became the Mufti in the area of Iran and in Medina Munawwara, Nafi'a, the student of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu became the Mufti of Medina Munawwara and different people were chosen to be the Tabi'een were chosen to be the Mufti in different parts of the world in different towns in the world. But finally there was a need now to compile all of this. It cannot continue in that manner forever. Just like Quran al Karim. <laughs> Initially, there was no need to compile it in a form of one book. People had memorized it. And different people had small portions of it written in their homes. But there was not a single copy that would be a complete compiled Quran in a form of book that people can really go by that. During the time of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu thought about it. He said, we must compile Quran in the form of a book. Because what will happen now is, we see the Huffaz, those who have memorized the Quran. During these battles, they are getting killed. And they will be, of course, dying also one after another. And we don't want to just depend now on people memorized Quran from them. Yes, people would memorize it. 
But we don't want to just depend on that. We should have an official copy of Quran. That whenever anyone makes a mistake, they can always refer to that these are the official copies of Quran al Kareem. And if two people are having differences about some words or some any uh, ruling of the Quran of recitation, then they can get, go back and look at this, these copies of Quran al Kareem. Initially, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Why should we do it? There is no need. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do it, then there is no need now. Umar radiallahu anhu's response was, during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was there. Anyone will have any question about it, they all will go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now we can't do that. People won't just go to one person. And Islam is spreading all around. We must have these copies. Finally, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was convinced. And in fact, the words that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used are very strong. He, he used the words for Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, فَشَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرِي لِمَا شَرَحَ بِهِ صَدْرَ عُمَرَ Allah opened up my heart and gave me the understanding that he gave Umar before me. It was something that from Allah came into the mind and the heart of Umar radiallahu anhu, anhu to think about compiling Quran. And finally then, they called Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu, and Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu compiled the Qur'an with the help of some other Sahaba radiallahu anhu alayhi Now, same thing, at these different, different scholars are in different towns, but now people are seeing gradually, the people who are of that level of ishtihad are not so many as much as they had in the time of the time of Sahaba radiallahu anhu alayhi then during the ta time of Tabi'een, then during the time of Taba Tabi'een, the number is getting lower. Because now, initially we had people who can always go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever they have any question, Ya Rasulullah, I made this mistake. What should I do? Do this. But after the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people had to refer to Sahaba radhwanullah alayhi wa sallam. And there were many Sahaba who were not of the level of ishtihad. So they would go. They would go to another Sahaba Ridwanullah alaihi like the people of Makkah Mukarramah. They will always refer to Abdullah ibn Abbas. People of Medina. They will always refer to Zaid bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. They will not just issue the fatwas by themselves. In fact, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah have narrated a very interesting story in his Sahih that some people want to perform Hajj from Medina Munawwara in Makkah Mukarramah. They had a question about a woman who cannot perform tawaf anymore. She is not, <coughs> she not, she cannot enter the haram anymore. So she cannot perform the tawaf. So they went and asked the question to Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and he gave a fatwa that was not according to the fatwa of Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. And Zayd bin Thabit wasn't with them in Hajj. Some of them knew the ruling of Zayd bin Thabit about that issue. So when Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu issued that fatwa, they said to him, Abdullah, we are the people of Medina. فَلَا نَدَعُوا قَوْلَ زَيْدٍ وَنَأْخُذَ بِقَوْلِكَ We will not do this, that we will accept your opinion regarding this matter and not follow Zayd bin Thabit because we are the followers of Zayd bin Thabit. So therefore we are not going to accept your fatwa about it. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu didn't mind it. He said, that's fine. But do one thing, when you go back to Medina Munawwara, Um Salama radiallahu anha has some more details about this. She knows something more that Zayd bin Sabit may not have that information. So ask Um Salama and convey all of this message mine and Um Salama's to Zayd bin Sabit and then see if he changes his opinion, then you follow his new opinion. So they went to him. And they did what Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu told them. So they went to Ummi Salama radiallahu anha, asked her the questions, and then they went to Abdul, uh, Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. And after hearing all of these different new hadiths that he got, or uh, information that he got together from Abdullah ibn Abbas and Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ummi Salama radiallahu anhu, Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu changed his opinion. So the people of Medina then followed that new opinion of Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. This is how they were going with it. But of course, now after the time of these Sahaba, and after the time of Tabi'een, where are you going to have mushtahid at every time 
throughout the history up to this day in every term that can do that ishtihad in all of these matters of sharia. And people, you know, the kind of people that people can always trust. It's very difficult. In those days, okay, at least this is a sahabi, will trust him. But after that, it's difficult. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> made some people think about compiling the fiqh. So that once it's compiled in those days, which was called Khayrul Qurun, the best of the time by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Khayrul Qurun i The best century is my century. The best time is my time. ثم الذين يلونهم then the next century after me ثم الذين يلونهم then the third century after that ثم يفشو الكذب then people will have the habit of lying so then lying will spread so three centuries and after that people will get into the habit of lying so it will be difficult to trust so subhanallah if we look at compiling Quran compiling the hadith and compiling the fiqh the three main sources that we normally follow and the books that we normally would refer to. All of these things were compiled during the, these, three, the, these three centuries that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said are the best centuries. Quran, Hadith, and Fiqh. And we may think now what about the rest of it? If you take Tafsir, if you take the Sirah and some other sciences, they all are taken from these three sources. Most of the sirah is from the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this, he did this, or Sahaba say that he did this. It's all part of the hadith. Then we then we take it from there and we compile a book of sirah out of that. Or Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam issued a ruling about an ayah of Quran, or he gave some explanation to it. That is tafsir. So it's all driven from there. So the main sources of the Sharia, all of them were compiled in the first century, in the first three centuries. I'm not going to go into the details of compiling the Qur'an or compiling the Hadith at this time. Insha'Allah, we will talk about compiling the Hadith after we finish with these topics and as we will talk about Muhaddisin. Then Insha'Allah, we'll talk about how Hadith were compiled and what type of work was done in compiling the Hadith. But first thing, Qur'an was compiled. That was during the time of Al-Khulafa al rashidun <coughs> Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu during the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu although it was written at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam compiling doesn't mean it was not written up to that time it was written before that it was written at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but compiling it in a form of a book and then having some books that are considered to be the official copies of Quran al kareem that always people should refer to these copies of Quran al kareem it was done during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, finalized at the time of Sayyidina Usman radiallahu anhu, that has a lot of details to it. We won't go in, into that at this time. After the compilation of Quran, the second topic or the second science from the Islamic sciences that was compiled was fiqh. And that was done during the time of Tabi'een, Rahimahumullah, which means the students of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een did this work. And the first person to think of doing that work, compiling it, so that people will have these things available to them. I made a mistake in my salah. Instead of Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim, I said Subhan Rabbi al -Ala. I don't know what to do. People will have these type of answers handy to them. That here you can refer to this book and find the, answer, find the answer for it. The first person to think about it, his name was Nu'man. Nu'man started thinking about compiling it, and he was the student of four, five of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi mashma'in. He initiated the work, and he started forming committees for that, started talking to people about it, started working in that direction. How did he work? What steps did he take? And then what was the success of that work that Nu'man did during his time? Inshallah, we'll talk about that in our next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the tawfiq to follow this authentic form of the Qur'an and the sunnah and the understanding of it, which is called fiqh in our sharia. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talking about it says in a hadith, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ The hadith is Sahih al-Bukhari. 
when, I, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something good out of a person, when Allah wants something good out of a person, He gives him the understanding of this thing. The word used in the hadith, يفقهه, give him the fiqh, which means the understanding of the deen. In other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this hadith is also in Sahih al-Bukhari. He gave the example of the hidayah and the ilm that he was sent with. He said, the example of the hidayah and the ilm, the knowledge that I have sent with, is just like a heavy rain. There was a lot of rain, and as it started raining and was raining heavy, there were different types of land. Some land started taking the water, and the water is disappearing. The water is getting inside the ground. People thought the water is disappearing, but finally it started having a lot of growth. All different types of growth. People are seeing vegetable there. People are seeing fruits over there. All kind of all kind of fruits there. So this was one type of land. Took the wa- took all the rain. Took all the water of the rain and started producing all of these things that are beneficial for, for people. There was some other land. It started gathering the water in it, but of course the land was strong and would not allow the water to get in it. So the water is gathered over there. Still, people are benefiting from it because water, water is gathered over there. People can go and get water from there. And they can use that water whenever they want. They know that we have water over there. And there was another type of land that never took the water in it to produce something good and that never kept the water gathered for people so people can benefit out of it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَذَلِكَ مَثَلُ مَنْ فَقُهَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ this is the example of those who got the understanding of the deen, they got the fiqh and the understanding of this deen, and they, Allah has benefited them through the ilm, through the uh, knowledge and the hidayah that I have sent with. That there are some people who would not learn this knowledge. They will not pay attention to this knowledge. They are that, just like that land that never get, gathers anything, that never takes the water to produce anything good for people. So people have no use of it at all. But there were some people who were not able to understand everything into depth. They were not able to go into the depth of all of these rulings and instead giving people the fatawas and these type of things, but at least they started keeping the knowledge and then giving it to those who may use it. So they learn the Quran for example. They memorize the ayah of Quran. Now in the masjid people are discussing a ruling. The person who is who has the good understanding, he knows the language, he knows everything, doesn't remember the ayah. This Hafiz al Quran will tell us that this is what the ayah says. So this person himself does not understand it, but at least he kept it. There are muhaddisin that did not go into the depth of the meanings of the hadith, but at least they kept it first. And then they gave it to those who would use it. And the third type of people that Rasulullah mentioned is those who would take this knowledge, who would take the Quran and hadith, they would digest that, and then they will produce all kind of beautiful and helpful things for people, beneficial things for people, in the uh, form of ahkam and the masail and the sharia. So the person is taking an ayah, but when you ask him, he's giving you 10 different rulings. Where did you get it? I got it from this ayah. Just like, where did you get all of this fruit, this vegetable, all of these things from? I got it from the water of that ring of that day. This is that land. That are getting all of this and then producing something much more beneficial and needed for people. So there are different type of people according to learning the deen of Allah and understanding it and getting into the depth of it. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is explaining, that people who go into the depth of it, they are very beneficial, and these are the people who Allah has blessed with the deep understanding of the knowledge of the deen. May Allah give all of us that understanding of the deen, and may Allah use us for the deen, and for teaching and learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَعْرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَآخِرُ